I had spoke to her one time and the girl knew that her dude tried to holler at me. And I mean, she was so nasty to me. I'm like, bitch, I could have your dude, but I didn't. I did you a favor, bitch. Hello there, Bellas. If you have not already done so, please hit the Patreon link below and or the join button here on the YouTube. And for a small monthly fee, you babies, yes, you can be privy to all the shenanigans before the YouTube gets it, if the YouTube gets it. Speaking of the shenanigans, for all the paying members, I need you to go to our community wall and check out what I just posted because I need an answer. The same thing for all my Patreon members. Please go on over there and let me know what you think. Now, let's continue talking about Latoya Jackson by Latoya Jackson. Working for Joseph, Jack couldn't help but notice how we kids had little to do with him. He was mildly appalled. Why do you treat your father the way you do? He often asked me. He's only trying to help me. Joseph's abusiveness was a shameful family secret that I couldn't bear revealing to anyone then. So I always changed the subject. Besides, not knowing much about dysfunctional family dynamics at the time, I still wasn't sure if my siblings and I weren't somehow responsible for his behavior. So anyway, I was messing with this young lady. And she was the oldest daughter too. And one thing she said to me that made me like instantly fall for her. What this young lady said to me was, man, I just felt that all I was was a babysitter. She put into words what I had always felt like. So it took me maybe to my 30s to know that I wasn't the only person to feel like that? You don't know yourself until you see yourself. Before long, my father gave Jack more responsibility in handling my career. In 1985, Jack independently arranged for me to discuss some possible film roles with Sam Weisbord, president of the powerful William Morris Agency. Though the meeting proceeded smoothly, I was nervous about being there. I knew Joseph would explode if he found out, accusing Jack of sneaking behind his back. Mr. Wiseboard, who'd shepherded the careers of stars such as Loretta Young, seemed to like me. We groomed all those women, he said, pointing to several portraits on the wall. But you already have what it takes. Then he turned to Jack. I worked with her father many years ago in connection with the Jackson Five. So I have to warn you. We can work with Latoya only if he is not involved. I'd suspected many people in the industry felt that way about Joseph, but this was the first time I'd actually heard someone say it. The two men asked that I leave the room so they could confer alone. When Jack emerged from the office, he appeared upset. What did you talk about? I wanted to know during the drive back to Encino. According to Jack, Mr. Wiseboard said to him, she's obviously a battered child. I know. Latoya, Jack asked intently, be honest with me. Have you ever been battered or abused? No, I replied. Does your father ever beat you? Of course not, Jack. Why would you ask such a thing? He does, Latoya. You're lying to me. Don't lie. I thought my act was convincing, but Jack didn't buy it. Jack, having yet to witness one of Joseph's raging fits, was shocked. I can't believe your father did that. He said to me incredulously, forget it, Jack. That's how he is. You have to listen to me. I don't want to go through this again. I tried to make him understand. My parents won't let me live away from home. If you try advancing my career, it will only blow up in your face. Mother and Joseph pretend they want me to succeed, but they really don't, especially mother. This part right here, it gets a little, okay, girl, wait a minute, girl. I see you, girl. Now, I was riding with you from the beginning to this part right here. This part right here, I'm going to have to look at you a little sideways. The older I got, the more she treated me like a little girl. 
tightening her grip. She spent her entire adult life being a mother. Nothing was more important to her. Now that only Michael and I lived at Havenhurst, the prospect of an empty nest must have gnawed at her. My mother's involvement in the victory tour and her bitterness over Joseph's ongoing affairs had changed her. The woman I'd known all my life, so sweet and meek, had metamorphosed into a suspicious, petty individual. I understood her mistrust of strangers to a point, but not her sporadic flashes of mean-spiritedness at home. Pause, I know you're like, nay, you got a lot of stories to tell. I do today. When I was dealing with the Texan, I was so, like, I was so messed up in the head because he was such a dirty person. He's the kind of guy that if you're over there looking at a pair of shoes, he would be over there saying, oh, that's my sister. I'm just going to buy my sister a gift or something like that and trying to pick up the cashier. That's how bad he was. My head was so messed up that I started being mean to everybody. Another girl okay. that did that too. I had spoke to her one time and the girl knew that her dude tried to holler at me. And I mean, she was so nasty to me. I'm like, bitch, I could have looked your dude, but I didn't. I did you a favor, bitch. You need to be shaking my hand. I understand when you're in a relationship like that, sometimes that takes over your soul. But you got to check that shit. She now talked about people, including her own children, viciously behind their back. When Marlon completed his first solo album, Baby Tonight, he brought us a bunch of advanced copies. My brother had fought hard for his artistic independence and was deservedly proud of the record. I was so excited for him. And as soon as Marlon left the house, we put on a tape of the album. This is very good, I commented, tapping my foot. But my mother snorted. Marlon can't sing. Why doesn't he just hang it up? He has no talent. With that, she walked over to the cassette deck and shut it off in mid-song. But the next time she saw Marlon, she pretended to have loved it. Observing her two-facedness a number of times, I remarked dryly, Mother, you're really a great actress. Hmm. I never had a manager other than Joseph, automatically resigning with him annually for a subsequent one-year term. Once entertaining fantasies of finding myself someone else, I'd resisted signing my new contract. In my father's mind, however, there was never any question that he would continue handling my career. I stalled as long as I could, but he finally thrust a new contract into my hands and barked, sign it. What? Just sign a contract. I haven't even had time to read it. You don't need to read it, he said irritably. It's a contract. Here it comes again, I thought, and predictably it did. You just perform, he said, and leave the business to me. Lately, this line had become my father's mantra. I had left the business to him, which was why I wanted a new manager. That contract ran its course, and for over a year after its aspiration, Joseph continued managing me. Even mother seemed to realize I had to break away advising, get away from him. He's no good. Get a lawyer, which I did. Joseph knew I was unhappy, a fact underlined by the flurry of registered mail letters my attorney sent to him stating my refusal to renew the agreement. Yet all during those months, my father came home every evening and acted as if nothing had happened, leaving me to wonder, did he get the letters? Did he read them? Should I say something? Girl, go for it. Oh, she's not happy, Joseph replied sarcastically. Okay, I'll tell you what. You can manage her and we'll split it 50-50. I'll stay out of it completely. You'll have complete control. And that's how her husband got her ass. Gotcha, bitch! I never would have predicted such an outcome. Even though my father wasn't fully out of the picture, I was thrilled. And even though Jack might not have been my first choice for a manager, he was a friend and an ally. It was a decision I could live with. Okay, girl. In 1986, I signed a deal with 
Private Eye Records, a CBS affiliate, and set about finding a producer for my third album. This was the first time I, and not my father, got to determine who I'd work with. One of the people at my new label, Danny Davis, suggested I meet with Phil Spector, whom he knew quite well. Of course, I was, oh, that's, that's trick, that's trick. Who's this, Danny Davis? He not your friend, girl? He don't like you. He can't like you. Of girl. course, I was aware of Phil's many million selling records in the early 1960s for such acts as the Ronettes, the Righteous Brothers, Ike and Tina Turner, and the Crystals, and, and his unique symphonic wall of sound style. He'd also produced the Beatles, Let It Be, and albums by George Harrison and John Lennon in the 1970s. Since his heyday, though, Phil had recorded only John's widow, Yoko Ono, the punk group, the Ramones, and one or two others. His taste certainly seemed electric, and he was a legend with a capital L. So I looked forward to meeting with him. As Danny and I drove to Phil's house off the Sunset Strip in Hollywood Hills, he told me how some people found the producer a little bit dot, 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 well, strange. But you and Phil should get along fine, he assured me. I had no reason to feel apprehensive until Danny pulled onto the circular driveway. Bouncing over a couple of speed bumps, we saw several signs warning that the fence was electrified and the premises patrolled by attack dogs and armed guards. One sign that caught my eye read, you are here at your own risk. Phil's mansion was an imposing Italian style structure that would have made a great horror movie set. We were greeted by his servant, a tall expressionless man I'll call Lurch because it seemed to fit. Walking through its portals was like entering a different era. Though it was just early evening, the sun not even about to set, the house's interior was eerily dark. The decor was antiquated and very European, with lots of garlish candelabras, marble tabletops, dusty-looking satin and velvet couches, gilt wood, ancient books, and heavy velvet drapes that hung from the 20-foot ceilings down to the plush carpet. Wait a minute, girl. This nigga then drove you to the Adams family house? Everything smelled musty, as if no human had set foot there in years. Piped in chamber music and Lurch's menacing presence added the finishing creepy touches. Girl, I don't know. I would feel that death would be upon us in a situation like that. I don't know if I could feel easy. I would feel like Danny didn't goop me, child. Like like Danny and Phil didn't pull some kind of stunt and I'm about to be a sacrifice or some shit. Danny and I sat in the living room for about half an hour. I wondered if Phil was ever coming down to see us while Danny snacked from a plate of cheese and fruit Lurch had served. When Phil finally arrived, he looked as much as anachronism as his house, dressed in black, Cuban heel, beetle boots, bell-bottom pants, and an overgrown Prince Valiant haircut. It was like he thought it was 1966, not 1986, and that he was still a teenager and not a man in his mid-forties. Throughout this visit, Phil never took his eyes off me, girl Pauls. Okay, so, okay, I'm not saying that Phil was not enamored or entranced by the LaToya Jackson, but wait a minute, LaToya, every nigga in the world ain't in love with your girl. Okay, you could you could pause on that one because you 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 working my nerves with this. Every ninja that you come across just wants some of the Latoya, okay? But you ain't even talk about you in the Bobby. Throughout this visit, Phil never took his eyes off me. He boasted that he was working on material for me to record. Well, I'd love to hear what you have in mind, I said, and gestured towards a black concert grand piano. Maybe you can play something for me, girl. If I was you, I wouldn't show this man my femininely wild because this nigga is wild. No, he replied nervously, then just as quickly composed himself. No, let's get together again. I have a lot of ideas. Well, okay. Maybe he was just shy. As Danny and I drove home, I expressed some reservations 
To be honest, Danny, I found Phil a little bit strange. Again, he told me not to worry, that the producer was adamantly eccentric, but in no way dangerous. Okay, Danny, if you say so. The next day, Phil called me at home. Listen, Latoya, he said intensely. I want to work with you alone. I don't want anybody from the record company to come. Just you and me, the two of us. We'll get a lot accomplished. That evening around dusk, I drove to his house by myself. Hey, hey, hey.